so interesting, you know? It's like very, 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 very interesting today. Like, can you believe? No, it is hella interesting. Remind me that I got to tell you about what happened. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, I don't know. Is this something that we can like talk about now or is this something that we can talk or we're going to have to talk about offline? Because, you know, guess what, Jolyn? What's up? We're live right now. Oh my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) Almost caught me slipping, but not quite. (laughs) All right. So how are you, Jolyn? You doing good over there? I'm, I'm loving the color. I'm loving I no, feel I like you know, red. I had to, you know what? You know the vibes. I had to wear red. You know Wonder Twins had Wonder Twin Powers activate. <laughs> Got my red Tesla back there. You know? I saw that. That is nice. I see you with the die cast. Amazing. Well, you know, it's interesting. Before we get into some Tesla things, we first gotta give some shout-outs. Like, who was the first person here? Hmm. Shout out to Jalen. Shout out to Jalen. Third time in a row. But guess who came in right after Jalen? Reggie. Yes. (laughs) Jalen is coming to play. He's not coming for the play play. So congratulations to you, Jalen. Yo, we thank you for just definitely having your notification turned on. And today is going to be pretty lit. So if you are if you are watching this video, go ahead and share it like it subscribe if you're new because welcome aboard we're the come up series if you haven't noticed before and on top of that if you like it then go ahead because it helps the channel apparently i guess apparently it brings in other folks into the landscape and this is going to be one of the dopest shows that you can actually you know be in the perspective of seeing for the first time and on top of that if you want to be in the know like jalen was like how he kind of like edged out slightly cousin reggie Go ahead and hit that bell so that way you can be a part of the notification squad, aka the Cool Kids Club. So today we have a very, very awesome show, like very, very awesome. And I know that we're going to get into some of the stuff of what took place in the market really quickly so that way we can set the stage. We need to reset mm-hmm. the room yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because there was, a, there was a lot going on and you know what? We're here for it. So tell a friend to tell a friend. I'm looking to see if anybody uh, like threw up if, if the cousin spell come up yet. Not yet this week. They haven't done it yet this week. Yo, we got to get on it. From though, where I want to know where people are coming from. Well, first off, we have folks coming in from the Philippines. We have some folks from Toronto, Illinois. We have folks coming in, of course, from Claxton, uh, Georgia, Baton Rouge in the building. Uh, oh, we even have some uh, 206 cousins. Shout out to you, cousin Kim, in the building. Yes. Hey, yes. Kim, what they do? That's my girl. Uh, and then on top of that, we also have Ghana in the building, Memphis, Tennessee. Hey, it's insane. Yo, we are out here. We are out here in hella traffic. We got Philly in the building. We got North Carolina, Alabama, DMV, New York, Jersey, Smithfield, okay. Virginia, Brooklyn. Wow, we got we got San Antonio. Okay, shout out to the Central Time. Okay, we see y'all. Los Angeles. Peora, uh, Illinois, y'all trying to get me stomped. You guys are trying to stomp me because some folks are trying to like drop in their zip codes and think that I wouldn't know, but that's fair. Okay, I'm going to be on it. We got Florida in the building. Okay, all right. We got Canada still. We got Raleigh. Oh, this is a new one. Guess what? Hmm. Mexico is in the building. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. Oh, we got, speaking of which, we got London (laughs) there. Wow. Okay, man. Okay. We're really out here. We are out here. Okay. Jamaica in the building. Okay. Hey, what's that one? (laughs) (laughs) Somebody said bad news stand up. Shout out to you, Ryan Johnson. We see you. All right. Okay. So it's been a very, very interesting day. Uh, for those, if you don't know who we are, I'm Mark Monroe, and I'm a, I am here with my wonderful co-host, co-producer, good friend, and on top of that, she's a galactic catalyst coming all the way in from the future just to grace us here in the present. Ladies and gentlemen, take a seat as we take, as she takes her bow, give it up for the wonderful Jolyn GC and the place to be. That's right. Mark, you know. I could be a hype man. I'm working on it. I, you, you know what? I feel hype. Thank you. Okay. I what does it cause this Joe and GC in the place to be? And this ain't Hot Take Thursday. This is a cookout and we are ready to get it going. Let's talk about what happened in this market. 
We got the Dow blazing at 322.58 points. S&P 500 did something a little cute with 24.65 points. And the NASDAQ came through with a decent 97.98 points. The VIX came down mm -hmm. to 15.7 points. Mark, you already know I didn't look at the 10-year treasury note. But I got you. U.S. 10-year at 1.494. All right, so there you have it. Now, let's get down to this sector uh, performance breakdown. As y'all know, there are 11 sectors. We track the top three and the bottom three to see what that rotation is looking like. And we definitely have some rotation today. We have financials, energy, and communication services coming in at the top three. Now, for the bottom, we got communication, excuse me, consumer discretionary, hmm. utilities, and real estate. And Mark, did you know that utilities and real estate were the only two in the red today? Yes, I did. It's very interesting. Well, well, you know, we'll hopefully get into that and see how that relates to some other things out there. Now, for pick performance, aka the sips, y'all can find the sips um, at that come up series on our Instagram. Just scroll through, you'll find that post. We got CRISPR, C Web, and how perfect is this, y'all? Tesla coming in at number three. And then for our bottom three, we got. MasterCard, Apple, and TBT. But y'all, today there were so many 52-week um, highs. So, you know, let's talk about it. We got SC, we got TGT for Target, we got NVIDIA, we got Adobe, we got Visa, we got Microsoft, and crowd favorite for the 52-week highs, FTNT. So there you have it. You know... We, we here at FTNT, we don't want to toot our own horn, but you know, uh, <laughs> beep, beep. <laughs> we're here today. <laughs> but you know what, Jolene? I feel like, I feel like we're the room is, we, we got to set the room today because, you know, it's a very, very interesting day. And it's like, you know, honestly, it's like, I got the shades on deck just in case if needed. But, you know, because it's a scorcher today. It's a scorcher. But, you know, I would feel remiss, y'all, if we actually didn't have some fellow cousins up on stage with us. So we brought one particular cousin with us because, you know, I, I want to give a special shout out to this individual because honestly, if it wasn't for them today would not be possible because they made the introduction and they reached out and they asked for it and the cousins, you asked for it. And so here it is today. So we definitely want to give a shout out to cousin Dave and not only just give him a shout out, cousin Dave, where are you? Yo, about Cousin Dave, what's, what do? what's, what's going <laughs> on? Yo, I need to let you know that you really came through in a time where there was so much going on, like production wise, the come up series, other stuff. Um, and for you to, you know, step into a place of leadership um, at that time was clutch. So shout out to you, brother. I appreciate you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, give the man okay. his flowers in the chat. Yes. I oh, wish man. I <laughs> there you, go. you know what? I'm, I'm, feel, I'm feeling pretty extraordinary today. And I'm going to do something that's like, like not regular here that we do on the Come Up series. So, Dave, it, as, as, you know, as an honorary cousin today, like, because you're, you're, you're honored today, we're giving you your flowers yeah. today. Thank I you, feel like you. I would be remiss if you did not introduce our special guest for today. Well, absolutely. So family, cousins, aunts and uncles, stay tuned. We got a really very special guest today, our very own from Tessa Daily Podcast, Rob Mauer. Hey, hey, hey. shout out to Rob. How are you doing, brother? How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. <laughs> now, Rob, before we went on live, I said, like, you had the calmest voice yeah. in all of YouTube. <laughs> I'm so for That's those... my number one goal. <laughs> exactly. So for those of you that don't know, and I don't know if, if you've been living underneath a rock or if you're just unaware, Tesla Daily Podcast is ran by Rob Maurer. He is like one of the greatest researchers when it comes to all things Tesla, as well as electric vehicles. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But honestly, it's like, you know, I watch it every day. I, I mean, legit, like when I watch Tesla Daily every day, the whole house has to go quiet, like for real, for real. If not, they get the look like. So 
Thank you, Rob, for coming in because we're gonna we're gonna geek out a little bit. So, and I'm probably sure I, I'm not gonna be the only one geeking out with you. I'm probably sure cousin Dave is gonna be oh, yeah. geeking out with you. And you never know, you know, Jolene, you know, she said that she ain't a geek. geek but... I don't geek out. Okay, I participate. I celebrate, and I can't wait to get into some questions because Rob, I do have some questions for you. So, yeah. well, Jolene, you're only you're the only one out there with the uh, the Tesla diecast in the background right now. So, <laughs> hey, tough on that. <laughs> all right so first things first let's 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 start let's set the stage like because we want the we want the people to get to know who you are today first i mean like tell us how did how did tesla daily get started like how did how did it all begin for you in setting up a youtube channel and doing a podcast and just talking about all things electric vehicles and and especially tesla how did that come about yeah, so I've been a Tesla investor all the way since 2013, uh, and spent just you know hours upon hours every single day researching the company. Uh, and at a certain point, you know, I had felt like I had learned enough where I was ready to start helping other people learn. Um, and one long drive, I was you know looking for something to listen to. Happened to think of searching for Tesla podcasts. There were a couple out there at the time that were really great podcasts, but they weren't as focused on sort of the business or the investing angle as what I was kind of interested in at the time. Uh, and that was back in the time where we had really poor, you know, even poorer than today, I would say media coverage of Tesla. Yes. So it seemed like every other day there was some article about oh, another Tesla fire. Like, is the company going to go under because of that? And, you know, when you actually look in the statistics and things like that, it's like, okay, well, fires are very less, you know, much less frequent in an electric vehicle and in a Tesla than, an internal combustion engine vehicle, it's more just a misperception because of the reporting. So, you know, I'd convinced other friends to invest in the company and whenever an article like that would come out, they'd send me a text and say, hey, do I need to like sell all my stock because of this? Or like Elon tweeted this crazy thing, like what's going on? And it was kind of just like, all right, here's the context for all that stuff. Um, and I figured, hey, if my friends have these questions, other people do too. So uh, that kind of combined with me looking for more of a business angle on the podcasting space, uh, I just kind of put two and two together and started Tesla daily, you know, four days after I had that idea and just kind of put the episode out and just kept doing it. <laughs> so we're going on, uh, we're going on almost four years now. Uh, I think we're oh. at like 850 right. episodes of, of Tesla daily. Thanks guys. Oh, wow. Appreciate that a lot. Wow. It's, no, been, it's been a wild ride. Oh man. Well, keep it going. Keep it going. Cause you know, there's a ton of cousins that are in the chat right now that are literally saying, yo, Rob the goat. So I, I think that you've <laughs> actually just taken on a title uh, or you actually have an honorary cousin title called Rob the goat. So I think I'll that we're going to, I think we're going to adopt that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, okay. So like, but you kind of hit it on the head, right? Cause there's a lot of misconceptions about Tesla or we like to call it FUD. And so I guess the question is, is that what is it that you think that what's the number one misconception about Tesla? Like, especially since you've been investing in Tesla since, you know, the beginning, um, what is, what would you say is like the number, what would you like rate as, or, or say is your top number one misconception about the company? Dang, I don't know if I've ever been asked the question that way. That's a tough one because I think it really ebbs and flows over periods of time. And I also think it kind of is different based on, you know, what group or what circle of media you happen to be reading. So I don't know that I could lock in on one. I wish I could. But, That's fair. <laughs> you know, I just think it's, it's a lot of just general misunderstandings that kind of all coalesce to create this, you know, overarching misunderstanding and missing context and, and things like that. But um, you know, for me, since I am in the investing space, a lot of the misunderstanding right now that I see is just around the financials. Mm. Uh, you know, people saying Tesla is only profitable because of regulatory credits, or, you know, even if we take that back a few years, people were saying that Tesla loses money on every single car they sell. That's never been true. Tesla's always had a positive gross margin. It's just been the fixed costs of their business that have, you know, caused them to have operating losses, but that's not the same as losing money on every car you sell unless you're being a little bit disingenuous with uh, how you're interpreting that, which of course people have been in the past. So I think there's just been a lot of, you know, for me, I guess I'd put the financials up there as, as number one, especially as Tesla's market cap has, you know, really uh, grown here over the last year. That's definitely an area for people to, you know, point to and say, oh, they're overvalued based on, you know, hardly being profitable and all that profit coming from, from a regulatory credits and things like that. So I guess that's what I'd narrow it down to. <laughs> Right. Rob, I, I do got a question, just uh, piggybacking on that um, point about scaling. 
Um, what Tesla did last year was incredible, just how they were able to open new, um, new factories, be able to implement a new process, new die casting and so forth. Um, how do you do that? <laughs> and what, what does a normal year look like for Tesla? Because I think we're still coming off of that, um, you know, 2020 pandemic year. So a lot of um, analysts are not really, really giving them their, their flowers as far as their ability to scale. I mean, they're opening up a facility in Giga Berlin. There's talk about, you know, uh, the Great Britain area. Right now we're looking at India as well. What do you think Tesla has, you know, up his sleeve? Yeah, no, it's, that's a fantastic question. And the first thing that came to mind as you were asking it was this article back in like 2014 that is a little bit infamous now where uh, the author said that Tesla's target of 500,000 vehicles in 2020, which was their target, you know, six, seven years ago, they ended up achieving that, of course. He said it was so ridiculous that it could never happen because if it were to happen, it would be like the greatest growth story in the history of all mankind. <laughs> And then, of course, 2020 comes, Tesla hit it, hits it nail on the head, and it's just like, okay, well, yep, it is one of the greatest growth stories of all time. Like, they achieved that. Uh, so that's why I say it's a little bit infamous now, because it's just, you know, that person was short Tesla at the time and betting against the company. So uh, kind of funny. But as for how they do it, you know, it's, it's I think what Elon has always said is it comes down to pace of innovation. And, you know, Tesla is, I think, in a league of their own in terms of the, the rapid acceleration of um just their business on a day in day out, day out basis. You know, when you compare them to a company like GM or Ford, there's, you know, unfortunately after a hundred years in business, you just get really mired down in a lot of bureaucracy and just layers and layers and layers of decision-making. And Tesla's a much more flat organizational structure where, you know, people do have autonomy. And then you've got Elon at the top that he's kind of managing the role that, you know, another company might distribute to, you know, maybe a hundred vice presidents and presidents and directors and things like that. And Elon is just so down in the weeds, which sometimes is a good thing. Sometimes is a bad thing, but it does allow Tesla to have that flatter organizational structure that is able to move much more quickly because of how involved Elon is where he can just make that call right away. And that's, that's the end of it. It just stops there and you know, they're on to the next thing. So I think that's a huge, you know, benefiting factor in allowing Tesla to have that pace of innovation. And then the other factor, I think it just comes down to their engineering roots and their prowess there. You know, Tesla is not a business that is focused on making money through business type of concepts. They're just trying to make the best product and every single day try to make that product better, try to offer more value to the customer uh, and hope that comes back to them financially. And, you know, it really has. And we've started to see that happen now as Tesla gets to that scale that you mentioned. Speaking of value, Rob, what is your price target for Tesla? Yeah, I get to ask this question a lot. Um, <laughs> the infamous I, price target. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm I don't just really time stamp it, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't really work off price targets in terms of my own investing. You know, most analysts are putting out one year price targets. For me, that's too short of a time period to really have any sort of semblance of where a price is going to go. Uh, I wish I did. I'd probably be a better investor if I did, but. For me, uh, I'm really looking at investment across, you know, at least five years, more so 10 years. Most investments that I've made, I've held for that period of time, uh, whether that's Apple, Netflix, Tesla, like those have kind of been the key, key investments for me. So yeah, I don't really operate too much on that, but if I extend out, let's say 2030, I'm seeing Tesla as a multi-trillion dollar company. What it is next year, I, I couldn't really care less. Um, it's more about End result. What's the progress in the business? You know, what, what are deliveries going to be next year? How are these factories coming up in terms of, is it taking one year from start to finish? Is it taking two years? Uh, and how does that build then for their growth of Tesla's targeting over the next decade to grow into eventually that multi-trillion dollar uh, market cap? And, you know, if, if today it's $600 billion and next year it's $400 billion, but I still view it as being a $3 trillion company or, you know, X trillion dollar company and in 10 years, doesn't really make too much of a difference for me, uh, as long as I still believe in that long-term path. Uh, quick follow-up. So with that being said, um, it sounds, you know, like your conviction is, I, mean, I have a question about conviction later, but it sounds like conviction is really um, what drives you as an investor. Um, so do you 
when it does dip, are you the are you the type that's just gonna go in and buy more, or you're satisfied with the amount that you have, and you just sitting there and just writing it out and kind of get into like what your approach is? Yeah, for me, kind of what depends on that is what I see as other investing opportunities that I might have high conviction in, uh, and generally, you know, certainly for the last five ten years, like Tesla has been in its own league in terms of the conviction that I have. So there hasn't been a whole lot else that's really caught my attention. Certainly there are other good investments, like no one's saying there's not, but that conviction point is a great point where, you know, I, I just wouldn't have that level of conviction in another company because I haven't done the level of research, you know, that I've done on Tesla, which is, you know, easily 10,000 hours by now, um, just researching every single thing about the company to get that level of conviction. And I think that's how you can kind of skew the risk reward ratio in your favor you know, every, every hour you put in of work is helping diminish that risk as you, you know, better understand the environment uh, that the company is playing in and the company itself. So, um, but yeah, you, you hit it right on the head. Like conviction is a huge part of how I manage my investments. I'm not trading based on technicals. It's really just like, okay, where's this business going? Where is the market overall going? Where's the innovation? Where's the disruption? And then trying to ride, you know, that vector as it, as it goes. So, uh, speaking of conviction, uh, it's, it's like, I want to kind of like stay there. Cause it's like, I, you know, I think you and I definitely have that strong conviction in such a company. So I guess I'm going to have to like switch it up and, you know, <sighs> put, put, the, <laughs> put the hat on today. Nice. So, so, so Rob looking at it, like one of the things that we've been hearing a lot about, and, and especially within the press is of course, full self-driving. That's like the, the ultimate, like it's like the ultimate frontier. It's like, we, we realize that electric vehicles is like, oh, well, you know, we had EV1 and then it's like, we had this long silence and I guess, quote unquote, people said hybrid Prius. Now we're at Tesla. Now it's like, we're, we're starting to see everybody and, you know, car makers that have been out forever and then all of a sudden creating a car. Um, but full self-driving, you know, I kind of look at that as like the next frontier, you know, what are your thoughts on it as it pertains to like, you know, where are we? Like, how far out do you like this could probably be a hot take, but, you know, where do you probably see us like as it pertains to years, months? You know, what do you project we will be, say, for example, in 2023, 2024? Is full sure. self-driving still is full self-driving still like in beta or do you think full self-driving is, has, has it been released to the masses? You know, what does that look like? Yeah, I think the question is difficult. And I think sometimes the answers get confusing as well because, you know, Elon has at times said, okay, we basically have feature complete full self-driving done. And it's like, okay, well, what does feature complete mean? It really means it's capable of handling, you know, I guess a drive with no interventions. It doesn't necessarily mean it can handle every single drive with no interventions or that it can handle some drives without an intervention all the time, which is kind of like a confusing different thing. So there's kind of yes. like, there's different levels. And then you've got the actual like SAE levels of, you know, full self-driving where you got level two, where, you know, it's really just an assisting feature. The, the driver is still responsible. You move up into level, level three and it's the driver actually gives over responsibility to the vehicle, but only in some certain settings. Uh, let's say like on the highway, for example, and then it alerts you if you need to get, you know, if you need to take responsibility back uh, with a given point in time. And then level four is kind of, you know, it can handle most things, but maybe it's still geofenced or doesn't operate in rain or something like that. And then level five is like, okay, if a human could drive it, this car can drive it. You don't need a steering wheel or anything like that. So if we're talking about level five, uh, you know, I think Elon did say late last year that he thinks level five this year, but I don't really think Elon spends any time thinking about those levels. I think he just thinks of it as like, okay, when can this car do a trip by itself? You know, yep. that, I think that's how he's thinking about it. So if I think about it that way, uh, you know, certainly if you look at the FSD beta videos that have come out over the last four or five months, Tesla's close, like they're close. The, the big question is how long does it take to get from close to finished? And unfortunately it's that March of nines, which, you know, it's no one really knows how long it's going to take. That's why we continue to see Elon say like, oh, we're like two weeks away, two weeks away <laughs> for, for months on end, you know, it's just, it's almost a meme at this point because it's been going for six months and certainly not the first time that we've seen, seen that from Elon on autonomy. So 
yeah, I don't have any better guess than anybody I else. I feel like we should have like a SpongeBob, a SpongeBob <laughs> two, two months later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. That's that's exactly what it is. So, um, yeah, I don't have a better guess than anybody else. The important thing for me is is Tesla leading the pack and is Tesla's strategy superior to other strategies? That's what I really come back to, and I continue to believe that it is. You know, if you listen to uh, Tesla's senior director of artificial intelligence, Andre Carpathy. He just had a talk, you know, earlier this week, I think on Sunday, okay. going through Tesla's approach with, you know, vision, why they feel comfortable removing radar from the vehicle right. because vision's getting, you know, so good at doing the tasks that they need it to do. Uh, and it just, I think it really reinforces Tesla's strategy. And the thing that Tesla's got that others don't is the fleet, you know, mm-hmm. other people like Waymo, they have to put a hundred thousand dollars into a car hope that they can then put that car on the road and then slowly over time collect, you know, $5 a ride or $10 a ride or something like that and accumulate that hundred thousand dollars that they spent on the vehicle, not even counting research and development. And Tesla's already covering those costs and making money by getting people to actually pay for the vehicles that they've got on the road testing and collecting data. So for the beta uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's just this, amazing flywheel that Tesla has created that no one else can really seem to match. Um, and I think that just sets Tesla, you know, very far apart from other competitors. And until I see something like that change, I just feel like Tesla's got a, a very clear lead. I think, you know, by 2023, maybe we're starting to see, you know, some signs of like a Tesla network where maybe in some limited areas, they're starting to do some of those autonomous rides and things like that. Um, maybe a couple of years after that, we start to actually see, Tesla sort of filling that Uber type of role. But again, I, you know, I can be off by a decade. Who knows? It's just, it's no one really knows at this point. The important thing for me is just where the positioning is, because as long as you're betting on the leader, uh, you should, you know, theoretically come out ahead. Hey, hey Rob, I, I do got a question after that one. Um, just speaking all about um, FSD overall. So there, there are some dilemma and acceptance to FSD, uh, especially from a lot of regulators. So what are your thoughts on the steps that Tesla needs to actually take and undergo for it to actually be successful, such as uh, Tesla insurance, for example, and the acceptance of that in every state? So can you tell me about your thought about that? Yeah, I think it's going to be a little bit tricky because there are different state legislations on this. Um, I think the good part is that there is there are states that, from my understanding, and it's not something I've looked at super closely, but... My understanding is that some states, I think Florida is one, don't like today, if you had an autonomous driving car without a person in it, it would be legal to operate on the roads. I think that's already the case in Florida. So, um, and I'm sure a few other states as well. So I think once Tesla gets to that point, they'll have jurisdictions where they can operate those vehicles in. And that'll put a lot of pressure on other states to, you know, get on board with that sort of a strategy, as long as it's proving to be safe, obviously. And that's where Elon just says, you know, we just have to accumulate the data, get billions of miles, show that it's effective and safe. And then, you know, how could you really argue with data once you actually have it collected? Uh, And going back to Tesla's fleet, they've got the best opportunity to collect that data. And on the Tesla insurance end, um, they've got all the telematics there uh, just from, you know, all the data they're collecting already in the vehicles to show that it's safe compared with other, you know, insurance data and things like that. And the insurance thing is, is a nice uh, sort of bonus for Tesla because someone's going to have to insure these autonomous vehicles at some point. And if Tesla didn't do it themselves or collect the, all that data to be able to do it with an insurance partner, you know, it, it could be very expensive for Tesla uh, and that's going to really help keep their costs down. So it's, it's really smart of them to sort of put the building blocks for that in place now so that when they do have, you know, Tesla network autonomous robot taxi fleet, they've got all that data and they can, you know, take that to insurance company, get a really good, uh, rate on those things. So Rob, uh, like, cause a lot of folks look at Tesla as like the car company. And so it's like, do we look at, do we look at Tesla as the car company now as say, for example, the energy storage company or the energy storage business is growing as well as say, for example, those other businesses that are growing within that are just brewing or how is it that, you know, especially for a person who's looking to like dive deep into into Tesla, how should they look at the company? Should they look at it as all encompassing in the sense of here's the company like Elon Musk, Tony Stark here to try to save the world from you know from from oil and gas companies, 
Or is it essentially like just Tesla, the car company, Tesla, the energy company, Tesla, the software company, or, you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah. And that's, I think you're hitting on like a great point that people don't, you know, people that are not bullish on Tesla don't fully consider, which is just all of the different layers of business that Tesla's involved in. That's the comparison set that people are choosing or just are not, you know, Tesla's got, you know, they've got the dealership level because they're operating their own stores. They've got the fueling level because they've got their own charging network. Um, in addition to the cars and then Tesla's doing all their own software. They're also more vertically integrated. We've seen that now with battery day, how they're going all the way down to the battery cell. So they've got that line of business, you know, people compare to like an automaker, but you've got already four different layers of businesses there that you need to say, okay, well, Tesla's got profits and revenues from each step there that other people don't have. So it's not a fair comparison to just say Tesla versus Volkswagen or Tesla versus GM and look at their, you know, price to sales or price to earnings ratios and say they should be equivalent because they're just not Tesla's involved in so many more business layers. So as for kind of the, the starting point of that question, Tesla automotive, Tesla technology, Tesla energy, all these things. Um, I do think the primary driver of Tesla's valuation for the next five years or so is going to be in the automotive space. So I don't spend as much time as Tesla on Tesla energy. It is, it's great. It's a good business for Tesla to be in. Obviously, it's a business that's going to continue to grow. I just think it's going to be a little bit lower margin of a business um, and certainly is going to take some time for Tesla to have the resources to be able to scale it fully, to be able to to compare with where the automotive business is going. Because the automotive business is growing so fast and the products there are so expensive, you know, $30,000, $50,000. Uh, when you're growing that business line at 50% a year and it's already a $40 billion business, any other business that you try to grow next to that is just going to stay pretty small, even if it is growing faster, uh, which Elon has said Tesla energy should do. So 2025, 2030 timeframe, I'm definitely very excited about Tesla energy, but I don't spend as much time thinking about it today just because I don't think it's actually fundamental to Tesla getting to you know, that multi-trillion dollar market cap that we talked about. I think they can do that with just automotive. And then I kind of view Tesla energy um, just as a bonus for them to eventually scale and grow into. And that can also help them too with their costs on the automotive side of the business. It's, you know, they're, they're increasing scale, certainly on batteries at least, uh, by having Tesla energy there as an option. So that can help actually bring the cost down in automotive too, uh, which is pretty cool. Rob, can we please talk about what just was released about these the supercharging networks for all um, and how that may contribute to Tesla's bottom line? Because um, I know when I saw that article, I, I was super excited because that is another way to usher in not just the adoption of you know people having EVs, but also another example of how Tesla is not did not come here to play games. It's all about leadership in all facets, and especially with as you were talking about the vertical vertical integration, and it's just becoming a one stop shop. So please, what what were you yeah, thinking? I mean- about? First thought on that is I would hate to be one of these other charging networks with, with that news coming out. Like that is, that's kind of a killer for your business, right? If Tesla opens up uh, supercharging to other cars. Um, I do think I th- you guys kind of caught me in the middle of research today because I was out doing some other work uh, this afternoon, but I think the article was about one, one or two superchargers in I think Norway being opened. And I think these superchargers had been publicly funded. So it's a little bit unfair for a public funded charging station to not be open. So I think it was isolated to just those couple and may have been a little bit misreported, but again, I'm sort of in the middle of my research on that. Either way, the question is still a valid question. And we had heard a previous rumor about Tesla working on, you know, an app and an adapter to open up supercharging. So uh, if Tesla were to do that, I think, you know, it definitely is a big opportunity to contribute additional revenue and especially profit uh, for Tesla because, you know, we just have seen earlier this week articles uh, forecast out from Ernst & Young, from Piper Sandler, expecting electric vehicle adoption to basically surpass 50% um, of the market sometime around 2030, maybe a little bit after that. But, you know, it's just going to continue to grow. We're going to start seeing millions and millions of EVs sold each year, and those vehicles are going to need somewhere to charge. If Tesla can fulfill that for them, there's a ton of profit to be had there. Um, I haven't sat down and done the math on it yet. It's something I'm, I'm wanting to do, but 
I do think it's a huge opportunity. And again, it's one of those elements that it just kind of exists in the business today, but people don't recognize the value of it because it's kind of hidden uh, beneath the rest of Tesla's business. And I think there's a lot of things in Tesla's business that are kind of that way. How do you think uh, Tesla owners will feel, would feel about that? Yeah, I think not great at first. Uh, <laughs> it it kind of depends on the implementation. You know, we, if you, some, some supercharging stations are already at capacity today. So it's like, if, if it's a holiday and you're traveling in California, like you might run into a line. If Tesla opens up their charging stations to other electric vehicles and that exacerbates those lines, people are not going to be happy with that. But if it brings in additional revenue and profit and Tesla can then, you know, accelerate the expansion of the supercharger network, well then, okay, maybe that actually ends up being a good thing for, uh, you know, Tesla owners as well, because then they have more charging options. So it's a, it's a tricky balance. And I think Tesla will, will find a way to manage it. I don't expect anyone to, you know, I don't think that's going to be the difference for someone to own a Tesla or not, uh, in terms of if I got to be careful how I word that because the supercharger network is a big competitive advantage and it's a really great reason to choose a Tesla versus another electric vehicle. Yeah. So I think more people, if other electric vehicles could access the supercharger network, I do think that makes the other electric vehicles more compelling and that could hurt Tesla sales a little bit. Mm. But I also don't think like that's going to stop anyone that wants a Tesla from buying a Tesla, I guess, if that kind of makes it, it's, it's a little bit, you know, it's semantics, I, suppose, I just had a vision of a Tesla owner sitting behind like i mean no shade uh you know a prius or something <laughs> just like uh, i got places to be i was gonna you took the you took the statement out of my mouth i was like rob so you're at a supercharging station and a ford f-150 pulls up and starts charging right next to you how do you feel about that <laughs> yeah. It's tricky. I think, you know, I, I do think most Tesla owners are for the acceleration of, you know, sustainable transportation and things like that. So personally, I would be actually pretty happy to see that because I think it's, right. it's an exciting thing. Like I'm excited to see the world transition to electrification. Uh, but yeah, at the same time, if you're having to wait another half an hour for that on a trip, then it's like, uh, well, <laughs> get your own chargers forward. Like you kind of have that, that mentality too. So um yeah, it'll be interesting, but I do expect Tesla to be able to, you know, handle that. Certainly they've got really, you know, as much data as you would need on the supercharging network Tesla's got, so they can make the decisions. They can see when capacity is, you know, becoming thin or, uh, overloaded and they can take that data and expand quickly. So, uh, you know, in the interim period, it might be a little bit challenging, but if that's the biggest problem for Tesla's business, I think that's a, ends up being a pretty big positive for them. So. And speaking of businesses from Tesla, or actually Elon Musk, what's your thoughts of uh, Elon leveraging a lot of his other businesses to really expand the adoption of Tesla, such as what he's doing in Vegas with the Hyperloop and the Boring Tunnel? Uh, what's your thoughts on that and the expansion yeah. throughout the major cities around the country? Yeah, I've got a friend out in Vegas that I need to need to go visit and check out the Boring Company Tunnel. Uh, it looks really cool. You know, I think they just opened to one of the conventions there a couple of weeks back and uh mm -hmm. Seems like the early reports were pretty good. They're not fully autonomous yet, the Teslas that are in those tunnels, but uh, I think they're trying to get to that stage before the end of the year. And I think that's going to be the first opportunity for us to see like a fully autonomous Tesla network because it is such simple circumstances uh, operating in that, you know, controlled environment. So that's, I, I assume that'll be the first place where we actually see an autonomous Tesla ride sort of for profit, uh, even though it is through the boring company. So it's kind of interesting, as you mentioned, Elon finding a way to leverage those other businesses to, you know, help Tesla um, and, and vice versa. And we've seen that with, you know, SpaceX before too. It's, it's SpaceX and Tesla always, oh, nice. uh, there's a lot of collaboration in terms of raw materials, um, sciences and things like that. And, you know, shared technology between the two, uh, which is great because they're obviously both extremely proficient uh, in those areas. So it's nice to have that overlap uh, and leverage, leverage all that engineering talent across both. Um, and we've seen, you know, even from a marketing perspective, when Elon launched the Roadster into space, like that was the number one period of time search, search wise for Tesla, number one or number two uh, in Tesla's entire history at that point in time. So even just little things like that, or like rolling the Model X's out ahead of the Crew Dragon launches and things like that, um, certainly good opportunity for for some cross cross promotion as well. I have a question. If you think that if, if the Roadster came back from space, 
<laughs> One, I don't know if we can get it back, so I don't think we want it to come back because <laughs> I think that means it's hitting us. I, I'm pretty sure it's in no, Mars I'm saying right if they're now. Able to, if they're able to capture it, if, if it was somehow some way able to be captured and come back to Earth. One, what, if, it, if, if it's drivable, would you drive it? <laughs> I don't think I'd get the opportunity, but yeah, you can't pass that up. <laughs> okay, so I guess the question is, is like, because we're seeing a lot of, I guess we all realize that one of the most anticipated vehicles coming from Tesla is the Cybertruck. And of course, we've been hearing a lot about like, for example, it being developed in, I guess, Giga, Giga Texas. And so the question I have for you, and of course, there's a there is the neighbor across the pond. Well, not really across the pond, but over a few states up. Um, <laughs> across the desert. Across the desert. <laughs> <laughs> creating a pickup truck. Um, that's, that's supposed to, that's supposed to be a huge, uh, competitor. What do you think about this space when we say that we have on one end, we have Cybertruck and then on the other side, we have, uh, we have Ford F-150 Lightning. And on top of that, we also have, I guess, the Hummer coming into the forefront. Like, what are your, what are your initial thoughts about that? Yeah. Uh, I was actually pretty excited about the Ford F-150 Lightning unveiling, um, I wasn't expecting it to start at $40,000. Turns out that's kind of just the commercial only version. So I think we still need a lot of details in terms of, you know, what Ford's plan to production capacity is, how many of those vehicles are they actually going to sell? Or are they just going to kind of limit it to the top of the line vehicles that run all the way up to, you know, $90,000 uh, or how that splits out, you know, anywhere in between. So I think there's a lot to, a lot to learn, but I was excited about what they announced. And I think it's probably, you know, I think they're going to be able to sell everything that they can produce there, uh, which which is great. I think the Cybertruck, certainly there's going to be overlap in the market, obviously, but I do think the Cybertruck is a little bit different of a category of vehicle where they're not necessarily going to be competing, you know, head on in every purchase decision. Like you might see, you know, if you're, if you're comparing like a Ford F-150 to, you know, like a Dodge Ram, those are obviously just the same segment, like direct competitors. I think the Cybertruck and the F one hundred and fifty are a little bit, you know, a little bit broader uh, than that. That being said, you know, I think Cy- Cybertruck's easily going to sell, you know, as many as Tesla can can hope to produce hundreds of thousands a year. I think, you know, kind of no brainer. Uh, just the specs are so good. Like the value that you're getting for that sort of a vehicle is is just insane. Um, especially as you sort of move up the the range. Like seventy thousand dollars is a lot of money. But seventy thousand dollars for a you know massive truck with five hundred miles of range that does zero to sixty in two point nine seconds, <laughs> that's just there's no comparison to anything else out there. Even in Tesla's lineup today, it's just it's like it's nonsense. So uh, yeah, they're going to be able to sell as many as they want. I'm not too worried about anything in the competitive set just because it is such an amazing um, value proposition. So for me, it's like you know I just want to see more electric vehicles from from these other guys and. Um, the more that they can do, the better. And I think it's actually good because Tesla kind of left some space there for, for the Ford F-150, for, more, for people that just don't want to do a Cybertruck and because of the aesthetics of it, which it totally, totally fair if you don't want that look. Like, look is a very important thing for people when they're buying a vehicle. But what do you think about Rivian, though? I mean, because Rivian's been kind of like the silent company that's been <laughs> creeping up, creeping up. So then that adds in another player into the space. So if that's not a direct com- competition between the Cybertruck and the Ford F-150. What are your thoughts on Rivian? Yeah, I think Rivian's another one in that space too that Tesla kind of left open a little bit in terms of they, they're they a little bit more in the middle. They did a little bit different things with the front end. Uh, yep. It is a smaller size vehicle too. So I think Rivian's, you know, they've got plenty of space to operate there as well. Uh, and certainly they're well-funded, you know, Amazon doing the partnership with them, investing a lot in their rounds uh, as well. And I think, you know, I think they're valued above 25 billion and maybe hoping to go public somewhere around 50 billion or something like that somewhat soon. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, plenty of funding. They, they were in stealth mode for a long time, which I actually, you know, I appreciate that they weren't out there like some other, uh, <laughs> yeah, some other companies that we don't need to name in the EV space that have not followed that sort of methodology quite as much, but I'm going to just put them, we're going to put them, we're gonna put them in witness protection. <laughs> So, so I appreciate that Rivian hasn't really operated in that way. Uh, and 
you know, I think they're really close to shipping those first vehicles. Uh, I think the user interface just leaked out a you know a couple couple of days ago. So I'm excited to see see those come to market uh, and see what Rivian can do. But again, the the production constraints here are the biggest thing to watch. Like it kind of is up to these companies to produce and see what they can make in the market. Same thing with like Lucid and more of the luxury space as well. There's plenty of market to go around. Tesla's, you know, at 500,000 vehicles, a million vehicles per year is half a percent to 1% of the market. There's still 98, 99% of the market up for grabs. So uh, yeah, I don't, I don't care too much about, about that. It's just kind of like, you know, do you guys' this thing, create as many vehicles as you, as you can, try to get to that level of profitability, which is extremely, extremely hard. Uh, and if you can, great. There's plenty of market, even when Tesla's at 20 million vehicles per year, we still need 60 million others. So like, go, go get it. So it's interesting that you mentioned a million vehicles because a lot of folks on Wall Street have been asking, hey, is this going to be the year that Tesla produces a million vehicles this year? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't done my full year delivery forecast yet. Uh, maybe ask me again in like a week once we get the key. I was going to say, those are pretty legendary. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll go into it for sure. But I think I'm probably somewhere just ballpark right around like 900,000 right now. It really depends to me on uh, Berlin and Texas if we manage to get any production. The only just I've seen on Berlin is is November. So if that actually is the case and they can, you know, do 25, 50,000 vehicles in, in a quarter there, you know, maybe that's a little bit lofty. But uh, and then if we get that from from Texas as well, I think that could push Tesla to a million. Uh, but I was actually just having this conversation with uh Pierre Farragou of New Street Research a couple weeks back, uh, analyst that I've got a ton of respect for. And we were talking about, you know, it doesn't really matter if Tesla does 800,000 or a million this year, because if you go forward three months, the trailing 12 months are probably going to be a million vehicles. Like it's, it's just a matter of how the calendar year falls. Like who really cares? (laughs) And for me, I'm like, I'm investing for 2030. I don't, I don't really care. It'd be nice to hit it. It's a great milestone, but if they hit it a quarter later, like that's fine too. (laughs) Go ahead, Dave. Great. So, Elon's a genius. We know it. We, get, <laughs> we, got, we, we just got to put that put it out there. One of the biggest issues with Elon is he can be a wild card with his tweets. So, what, what's your thoughts on how stable Tesla would be as a company if Elon didn't tweet as much? And does some of his tweets actually make you cringe like it does to <laughs> some other folks here? <laughs> I'm going to plead the fifth on that part of the question. <laughs> uh, stability wise. Yeah. I'm sure it would be a little bit more stable. Uh, the good thing is Tesla doesn't really care about stability. You know, Elon has said, if you don't want a volatile stock, like straight up, don't buy Tesla stock. You know, he's very open about that, uh, which I appreciate. And for me, again, the stock could be, a share next year, I would still have the same number of shares and I would just keep buying more. So (laughs) I don't, I don't, I don't care too much about the volatility. It actually makes it a little bit more fun, uh, more stuff to talk about. Certainly if I could choose of like putting more constraints on Elon on Twitter or leaving it how it is, I would pick leaving it how it is every single time. Uh, Elon's very unique in terms of his approach to communication and managing the business and I think he is one of the few people that is actually able to somehow pull that off. Like you don't see other other CEOs out there tweeting the memes that Elon's tweeted. Uh, at all. <laughs> and if, if they did, they would probably be called in the board boardroom right away. Um, but Elon, he he can pull it off, and he can get away with that stuff just because of what he's accomplished. And it does add a little bit of a unique element to Tesla that if if that were to be silenced, would you know it would go away. And for me, that would be sad. I guess we'll get, when it comes down to Elon, you know, there's no such thing as bad publicity because all publicity is good publicity with him. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that with uh, one caveat of like the crypto stuff. I don't <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't know if that's doing any favors to anybody. Um, I just have a small position in Bitcoin, so I, I don't care about it from that perspective. But uh, it's certainly garnering a lot of negative attention um, by a lot of people that are wealthy individuals that could, you know, buy Tesla vehicles. So demand is strong. I don't think Elon cares too much about that, but um so maybe in the end it is good, but <laughs> it's fr- frustrating for a lot of people. So we're coming down to the, we're coming down the stretch. So, and I'd be remiss if we did not talk about China a little bit, because what were your thoughts in, like going through it when we started hearing about like 
some of the protests that were taking place. And then on top of that, some of the articles about like, you know, hey, deliveries may not be that good. Or for example, not selling that many cars, you know, what, what were your thoughts about that? What, what was going on, you know, as you were, as you were doing your research? Yeah. I've been following it super closely. Um, you know, I think what kind of kicked it off was, as you said, the, that brake failure protest at the Shanghai Auto Show. You know, that was the fifth, I think, protest that this person did, but that was the one that really started to catch a lot of attention. Um, and then, of course, following that, we had this report from the information that uh, Tesla's orders were down like 50%, new orders were down like 50% in May after mm -hmm. that event happened. So a lot of people were pretty quick to dismiss that report, uh, you know, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, I'm not saying it shouldn't be dismissed. I, it's, I guess, it's tough to find the words for it. <laughs> yeah, it should be taken with a grain of salt, but it's also not like something we should just write off just because we don't like it, you know, as Tesla investors. Uh, yeah. I think we're kind of conditioned now at this point to just take any bad news. And especially if there's not like a solid, some solid data point that we can point to, to say like, okay, clearly this is what it is. Like, this is a fact if there's anything that's speculative and is bad news or that we're not fully convinced is confirmed that that's bad news, there's a tendency to just be like, nope, not true, FUD, like just fake news, fake news, fake news, which it makes sense. Like there's been so much of that, but at the same time, once you start doing that, you start losing a little bit of the due diligence aspect. So for me, I haven't found enough information out there to completely write that off as being fake or anything like that. So I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying like, I haven't had... I'm, I don't have enough data to rule it out yet. So I'm going to keep an open mind. And until I get enough data, yeah. it's just going to be something that I have my attention on and, you know, try to figure out if it's true or not. That being said, even if Tesla's orders were down 50% in one month, like I don't really care. There's going to be some fallout from all this, you know, negative publicity in China, but Tesla's got a great product. Like anyone that's experienced a Tesla vehicle knows that. And as Tesla continues to deliver more and more vehicles in China, more and more people in China are going to know that. Exactly. Like, like you, you get the car and it's like, okay, this is amazing. Like all this stuff that I've been hearing about, you know, quality issues or like whatever else, 95%, 99% of the people that get Tesla vehicles, you know, they have a great experience. So that's why the owner satisfactions ratings are so high. It, certainly Tesla's got work to do still, but they make great products. The more people that are in China that get their hands on those products, uh, the better Tesla's business is going to continue to be. So even if there is some short-term you know, turmoil that Tesla needs to navigate through. It's not anything they haven't been through in the U S yes, the China, China is a different market, but you know, I have full faith that full faith that Tesla's product is strong enough to pull them through to the other, to the other side of that. Um, eventually, if there is even an issue, which again, not confirmed, hopefully we'll get some more information on that with the, with the Q2 deliveries and the 10 Q <clears throat> when we get like the China revenue numbers and things like that. Okay. Final, my final question for you is exactly how did you, be, how did you convert Jim Kramer to becoming bullish on Tesla? <laughs> like, I, I, yeah. I just, <laughs> like, I, ever since he like became bullish on Tesla and he, like, it was, it was weird because I heard that he had had an interview with you and then all of a sudden, oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I was looking at Tesla completely wrong. Like, well, what? <laughs> How did yeah. you do it, Rob? How did you I do it? I don't know. As much as I'd love to take credit for that, I don't think I can take any credit for that. Jim did buy Tesla stock before we were ever connected um, okay. in his in his fund. So uh, he said that I think his wife or his daughter uh, had a Tesla, and he got to you know talk to them and actually experience the product, and that I think was what kind of converted him. Okay. I think the conversations that we've had, I think have helped his understanding, hopefully, you know, that's kind of the intent uh, from my end, at least is just to, you know, do what I did since starting Tesla daily, which is just get good information, you know, out to as many people as possible. Some, some people are like, oh, how could you partner with the street? How could you partner with Jim Cramer? Like he said all this bad stuff against Tesla, like all these years ago. I'm like, I don't care. Like, I'm just trying to, if, if anyone wants to listen to me, like I'm, I'm happy to talk to him. You know, I'm not trying to set up some wall because someone said something five years ago that someone didn't agree right. with, like I could care less. So, um, yeah, I'm just trying to get, get more information out to, out to people. And if Jim wants to listen to that, that's, you know, credit to him for, for being willing to have those conversations. You know, a lot of people wouldn't sit down and talk to me for 45 minutes if they, 
you know, don't agree with, with what I'm saying. Uh, like all the conversations I have with Tesla are with Tesla bulls. Yeah. And I've had a couple with with bears and stuff like that, but unfortunately like these days, I feel like things are just so polarized that it's difficult to have respectful conversations with people you disagree with. Uh, and it's just, it's a bad trend. Like we should try to stop, stop that trend. So um, I'm not saying that that's like the, the case with anything with Jim or anything like that, but um, I, I respect him for being able to sit down and have those conversations with, uh, with people like that. 100%, 100%. All right. You are officially off the Tesla hot seat. <laughs> I guess the biggest thing is, is like, cause we know of you from Tesla daily, but Rob, you know, what are some of the things that you like, you know, what are some of the things that you want the people to know about you be like outside of Tesla daily? Oh man. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I feel like I'm just like a normal, <laughs> normal guy that started a podcast and like we're still doing the podcast. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm a normal person, like play Rocket League on Xbox, like nice. play guitar. <laughs> oh, you play guitar? Yeah. Cool. Not, not great, but you know, I've self-taught, played it for, I don't know, since high school. So many years now, but, um, yeah, like hanging out with my friends. I, I live in Milwaukee, so the Bucks are in the Eastern Conference, Eastern Conference finals right now. Uh, lost game. How's that, how's that playing on your heartstrings right now? Like, how are you yeah. feeling? <laughs> It's been a roller coaster. Like I'm not a huge NBA fan, but you know, being in the city, I've been here for about a decade. Yeah. It's, it's just like a lot of fun to be a part of the environment and things like that. So I'm definitely bandwagoning on for sure. Um, but <laughs> no I feel like I have a right, a right being in Milwaukee, but yeah, it's been a lot of fun just watching those games um, and, you know, seeing what the bucks do. So <laughs> nice. Well, if you're ever in Seattle and if you bring your guitar, then we can just rock out. I play piano. So let's get it. Nice. Yeah, that'd be a blast. <laughs> Dave, did you have, since you're the honorary cousin for the day, I, I, like you're, you're the, one of the co-hosts. I'm going to let you end it on, on one of your questions. Go for it, brother. Certainly. Um, so for Tesla, for it to really hit that, um, I guess that, um, actually, sorry, let's do, let's do this. Going back to, to Elon's other business with SpaceX. Do you think that Tesla will actually get into VTOLs, vertical takeoff and landing? Ooh. Sure. Oh. <laughs> do, do, do we think that we ever will see flying vehicles? I know te- Elon hates that phrase, but you know, <laughs> you, you, you see that coming in Tesla's future? Maybe in the next decade or so? Yeah. One of my friends is like obsessed with this. Uh, Matt Joyce, he, he's always like asking anyone that will talk to him about this VTOL <laughs> stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um i don't know that i have a lot of thoughts on it i think elon's been asked about it quite a few times now and he's kind of mm-hmm. just like eh, i hope someone else does it i hope someone else does it <laughs> but we've seen tesla eventually get into spaces where elon has hope someone else does it battery cells being a great example uh i don't think vtol is quite as critical to tesla's mission as battery cells but uh yeah, I think it's a bandwidth thing. You know, Tesla's pretty constrained in terms of the engineering talent that they've got right now. Um, and I expect that to be the case for a while, but it's not something I'm, I would write off Tesla doing. Um, I think there's just, you know, a ton of opportunity to expand there. And something I'd personally have to see is like a, a Tesla boat, you know, that would be awesome. Mm-hmm. Those, those uh-huh. things are like so uh-huh. pollutive, both from, you know, an oil and gas perspective and just from a noise perspective that it would be great to have uh, some sort of EV uh, boat. Yeah, so you, be dope. I live by the water, so I would just be out there all day. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah, team throw a solar panel up on there. <laughs> I would be team motorcycle, team motorcycle, yeah. or team jet or, or plane. If we can get yeah. that going, well done. Well done. Yeah, I think Elon has said no motorcycles because I think he was in a pretty bad accident. Um, once upon a time so i think safety is not there for him but zero seems like they're doing really cool stuff with uh with ev motorcycles and you know i know a lot of the other manufacturers are getting getting involved in that too nowadays yeah i think there's also acromoto on the atv side and and a few other players so it should be pretty interesting rob thank you for joining us (laughs) thanks for having me for joining us and feel free to stop by anytime because of course i have a feeling that you know there's going to be a round two as more questions yep. come about. And as yep, we get I'd be happy to. So thank you so much for stopping by and just like, just sitting down and geeking out with us and having a wonderful session in powwow. So, you know, we're truly honored to have you here. So, you know, 
don't be a stranger because I think okay. officially you've now been knighted as Rob the Goat. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm deserving of it, but I, I will certainly uh, not argue with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Well, until next time, this has been an awesome time rocking with us. We had Rob in the building, definitely had him on the hot seat at answering some of the questions that some of you have brought forth and that we also have in, in our own back pockets. Thank you, Dave, for just stopping by and rocking with us. I mean, honestly, it is an honor, brother. It is an honor to share the stage with you as well. JoLynn, you always know the vibes. And until next time, I'm Mark Monroe, accompanied by my wonderful guest, is that me? Yeah, that's you. <laughs> Rob Mauer. And honorary cousin. My cousin Dave. And the wonderful. Jolene GC. <laughs> if we just had an outtake for every single show, if we had an outtake for every single show, it'd be amazing. And this has been a come up. We'll see you guys next week. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, stay safe. Uh, stay hydrated because it's going to be a scorcher across Ooh. the United States. But you know what? Keep researching, keep learning, and keep growing because the more you learn, the more you earn. <laughs>